So it is my great pleasure to have here Professor Herbert Waldman from the University of Dortmund, who has a huge experience in uh, drug discovery. He has consulted so many big, big pharmaceutical companies and other companies in this, that business. He is author of several concepts in medicinal chemistry. And uh, it is also a great pleasure that he had some collaboration. He has some collaboration with Inamin and, uh, and agreed to support us and support Ukraine in, this, in these hard times by giving us a lecture today. So, Professor Wagman, please have your time. I will. Thank you very much, Alexander. Yes, indeed. Um, nice to speak to you guys in these crazy times and these devastating times. I should say that. Uh, after all these pandemic time, these pandemic months and years we have now behind us, I've actually more or less refrained from giving online lectures. But when, when, when Alexander asked me, would you give us a lecture, I said, of natural. Any, 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 any way to keep the scientific connection between all of us, I think is absolutely worth doing it. So I'm pleased to speak to you online today. And uh, maybe a, one or two words of background to myself, which will put the entire um, lecture a bit in, in, into, into context. By training, I'm a chemist, an organic chemist. I'm a, a molecule maker, a synthesis person. But I live in an institute that is biological. So I live in a bio environment, but my group is mostly chemists. And if you live in such an environment, then um, concepts can emerge that unite chemistry and biology and they then also will rapidly, if everything goes well, uh, radiate into drug discovery projects. So that, that is gonna be a bit more the topic of today. So I share my screen and then we take it from there. Okay, so screen right here, and then minimize that. Okay, so the, my, the group I'm leading is called Chemical Biology actually. And I thought that uh, because I've not spoken to a community in Ukraine, I, I give you my personal definition of what chemical biology is. And then afterwards we can guide ourselves through this once. I need a pointer, just a second. Laser pointer, there we go. So about 20, 25 years ago, I just sketched this picture here, which shares, which, which describes one way of how research in a chemical biological environment can go. In, in, this, in this idea, the reasoning originally begins with biology. There usually is a biological argument that uh, inspires everything, a question that's open, not easily solved, and tools are required to solve it. In the chemical biology environment, from there one would deduce structural information. And this can be very different. This can be the structure of proteins. This can be the structure of uh, biomicromolecules, small molecules like that. that here, the, the realm of chemistry comes in. From these structures, then the chemical problem is deduced, which would be compounds to make, to learn more about biology. They could again be small molecules, they could be proteins, they could be oligonucleotides, it's very open definition. Once the problem is solved, one would then use the knowledge gained to generate tools, reagents, which would be applied in biological experiments to learn more about the biological phenomenon, giving novel insight, and once this insight is gained, is, is gained then it, a new circle may start again. So ultimately, this is not a closed circle, but it's a spiral winding itself forward into the future. And it will be, we will go through a circle and, uh, and, and see how we, can, how, how we can complete that. Initially, the biological problem I'm going to face to you is how does one, and this is one that frequently occurs in a, in a biology environment, but also in drug discovery, is how one interconverts phenotypes, morphological appearances. This here is a cell line, MDCK cells that are not mutated. They grow, they grow in a round shape. Um, they grow to confluency, which means they touch each other. If a mutation in a particular protein comes in, then these, they change their, their appearance. They become spindle shaped and they overgrow each other, indicative of tumorous growth. One would then, in terms of a chemical biology investigation try to find compounds which would convert this mutated phenotype back into the normal phenotype. That was done in this example, which I'm detailing to you here, published back there. And as you can see, when we apply this compound here to a palmostatin, 
to such spindle-shaped cells, they adopt a phenotype that is a partial reversion. It's confluent growth, no overgrowth anymore, and the, comfort, the, the cells become much more rounded. Not perfectly, but it, in, in a sense, they have approached the phenotype of the original wild type cell. From a chemical point of view, the question that is behind that, and that is not easy to answer, is why palmostatin? What guided us and what brings us to compounds, molecules, structures that are relevant to biology? How would one go ahead if one would want to make biologically relevant compounds? What, which design principles will be there that by definition lead to biologically relevant small molecules? What is that? Very fundamental question. Uh, several answers that have been given. By the time when this all started, we decided in my group that we would take a look at what was successful in the past, evolution, eons of development of small molecules in nature, and ask whether we could not learn from the structure of small molecule modulators of bioactivity as nature developed to reason them forward. And the example I'm giving you up here, palmostatin, is one for that. Palmostatin was modeled after lipstatin, which is a natural product in the of a lipase that has two double bonds more here in this chain. The tetrahydromolecule is marketed by Roche as, as early start. So we've modeled it after a bio, a, a, an, an active natural product. Since we want to ultimately study biology, of course, we would have to evaluate these compounds in cellular assays to see whether they can change phenotypes. And that has an advantage because it's completely unbiased. And if it's unbiased, that opens the door for novel, novel biological targets and also novel biology. But as everything in this endeavor, nothing comes for free. It always comes at a price because it will require that the biological mode of action and ideally the target, the cellular target, will have to be identified and validated. And that is a major task. And we'll go through it in this presentation once. Natural products as such, and I'm still in chemistry, even now at the point where the biological problem has been posed, now the chemical part will come. Natural products themselves are known to be very important. To this very day, uh, I think about 20, 25% of more, more or less of the compounds that make it to the market are inspired by natural products or are actually natural products themselves. However, they are often very difficult to access. Synthesis are lengthy, it's laborious, and if one wouldn't want to synthesize them, but isolate them from natural sources, then in many cases, these natural products have been identified only in minute amounts, and they are not available at scale. That is a typical problem. And this is termed the so-called synthesis and supply problem. And for that reason, despite the very proven success and the big value of natural products, the pharmaceutical industry has mostly abandoned them. This then leads to a new intellectual challenge. Since they are so potent, since they are so bioactive, couldn't we find a way and concept how we could capture the properties encoded in the structures of these natural products? Couldn't we capture them in a format that is amenable to chemical biology and medicinal chemistry? Research. Could we make libraries based on them? Would we find a way to make small molecules much faster than usual natural products have to be made and generate new compound classes that are inspired by them, but they will not be that hard to make? Is there a logic for the structural simplification of natural product, but keep the activity in? At the time, the logic we applied um, is sketched here. We took a look at all natural products and available at the time in, a, in the so-called dictionary of natural products. And this version up here in 2005, they had about 190,000 entries. This was then subjected to biochemical, to, to cheminformatic analysis. In this analysis, first of all, we took the structures of the natural products and counterintuitively flattened them out. That seemingly doesn't make sense because Three-dimensionality is important, but for many natural products, stereogenicity is not known, so you cannot work with it. And what's also what also was clear already then was that two-dimensional structures 
for an analysis I'm going to show you work approximately as well as three-dimensional structures. Charges were then removed, counter ions, uh, charges were normalized, counter ions were removed, and then the next step, everything was deglycosylated. And that is so because the bioactivity of these secondary metabolites often resides in the A-glycol. And therefore, the sugars, who mostly modulate pharmacokinetics, uh, were chopped off in the computer. The computer then isolates the scaffold, which means it strips off all acyclic substituents or not double bonds, and then subjects these scaffolds to a so-called parent-child assignment, where repeatedly, with each step iteratively, one ring is taken away from the scaffold to ultimately arrive at single ring scaffolds. Doing this with all natural products gives about 25,000 scaffolds that were subjected to a tree analysis that correlates structure and genealogies and allows to systematize the diversity in terms of structure in a very, I would say, intuitively accessible way. And I show it to you right here. When it was published at the time, PNAS, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, one of our national newspapers uh, known for, the, for its, for its uh, coverage of science, adopted the name, the Periodic Table of Natural Products, called this tree. It is, of course, a catchy name, which does, has not, it has, does not have the stringency of the periodic table. But what it does, it correlates complex structures in a logical manner with, seem, with seem simple structures. And thereby, it is more or less a map of what's out there in nature, giving the ability to simplify structure. We delineated from that an approach termed biology-oriented synthesis that followed the logic shown up there. We isolate the scaffold, make it smaller step by step, and all intermediate scaffolds will then inspire synthesis, like here, there, or there. All these compound libraries require about, say, three to five steps, so they are very accessible. We term these libraries now inspired by natural products, not identical, but inspired. They have scaffold, scaffolds that are based on relevance and evolutionary selection. They reduce the structural complexity and we've shown for a variety of examples that the kind of bioactivity remains. That is not the potency, but the type, say inhibits of protease, is uh, immunomodulated, things like that. And finally, because of that, it addresses the synthesis and the supply problem. These are very, very accessible. And we've made hundreds of them. By now, our in-house library is about 10,000 and more compounds. So far, so good. Everything worked well. We were very busy with that. About 10, 10 years, we synthesized and had to prove the concept. Many students and postdocs worked. Great work they did. And after some time, I, I realized personally that I had limited my group. I had limited my group in the reason. We just were busy. And maybe that was necessary to sort of at one point in time relax back and begin to think again. I had limited them because the concept I've shown to you does only partly coverage, uh, uh, only or partly, only partly cover, uh, often partly cover natural product, chemical, and biological plates. And that is so because if one focuses on the targets and on the, on the structures in nature, then of course one will only focus on the compounds in nature. And the community now knows that there are many more natural product related compounds, which um, natural product inspired and related compounds, which are bioactive, but do not represent natural product space. And the second one was, if we focus only on natural products, then we will also only restrict ourselves to the targets of those natural products. So it was limiting, Natural, biochemical, and biological uh, uh, coverage of biological, biological and natural space for this approach. The challenge was then in a second wave whether we could combine this biological relevance with a much wider coverage of chemical space and could we thereby find new targets and new bioactivity? Could we go beyond that? Could we expand beyond what nature did both in the chemistry and in the biology realm? In drug discovery, there's a principle term fragment-based design that allows to rapidly explore large fractions of chemical space. In this fragment-based design, initial fragments that fulfill certain requirements are combined 
in a in, 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 in a combinatorial manner, and thereby this can lead to an explosion in structures like that. So we thought, why don't we apply this, and we take natural product fragments, we subject all known natural products to fragmentation, and then reason from there. And this is shown right here. We deconstructed them into fragments following the logic and the procedure as I had shown you for the construction of the natural product tree. Initially, the computer does the same as before. It successively removes all rings, a child to parent transition in the computational sense. And in this case, we store all attachment points and all substituents, and we keep the stereochemistry in as well, because that will be necessary and uh, important for the subsequent design. This led us, after clustering of several hundred thousand fragments, which were obtained this way, to about 2,000 clusters. Among these clusters, they are diverse. Within the clusters, in, in, in the, in, uh, they are similar, similarity is high. And cheminformatic analysis then showed that these clusters and the cluster members represent the properties of the guiding natural products and the fragments in terms of parameters like stereogenicity, H bond donors, acceptors, and uh, nitrogen versus oxygen atom content. Also important, at the time, 2013, when it was published, for about half of the clusters, a representative member or the cluster center itself was commercially available. Now we are 10 years down the line, and I'm absolutely certain that many more of those um, members of such clusters are commercially available. And I will come back to this at the end uh, of my lecture. So, but the point to be, to be taken here is if one would want to use such fragments derived from natural products, one can do so without getting into a major synthesis effort because, in principle, they can be bought. So, we have deconstructed them. We came to these fragments. They represent the properties, and therefore, they also represent selection evolution, and they themselves will be biologically relevant. The goal then was to take these and recombine them to what we term pseudo natural products. So, what if we take an indo and combine it with a tropane to an indo tropane? You see this to the upper right. This does not occur in nature. Would I have claimed it is a natural product? I'm sure you would have believed. Combination with iridoids gives in the iridoids. We would take pyrrolidines and combine them to pyrotropanes with pyrotropanes. Does not occur in nature. They would be pure iridoids. Thereby, we would generate a novel class of natural product inspired compound collection. They are relevant to biology because they keep the original natural product fragment character in, but currently they are not accessible by biosynthesis pathways, and therefore they go beyond existing natural product structure. The question then will be, will they give novel and unexpected bioactivity at novel target? When this was worded, the concept was spun out. We did the first examples. I ran into a paper, or more or less I met, a longtime colleague, Jutta Heim, former chief pharmacologist at Novartis, and Jutta had switched to a company term Evolva in Basel. She sent me a manuscript in which the team at Evolva had done what I found a super interesting experiment. They had, say, they had taken yeast strains and subjected them to combinatorial genetics. They applied so-called horizontal gene transfer methods and then screened for novel compounds and their activity. Horizontal gene transfer means they expressed combinations of pathways uh, from different organisms, including different species among them humans, and asked, will there now be new strains that make natural products, secondary metabolites, which have not been in nature before? And they were successful. All the scaffolds you see up here were made by these strains, and none of them occurs in nature itself. Interestingly, the team in the paper concludes that the novelty on the scaffold level often would derive from new combinations of known natural product derived substrates. Or in other words, they had worded exactly what I have proposed to you in the last, say, 10 to 15 minutes. In this evolutionary experiment, the same conclusion comes about, and therefore we thought maybe one can regard these pseudo-natural products 
as a chemical equivalent to the evolution of natural product structure under regular natural conditions. Would that be a possibility? If so, a general principle would have been found. Thinking along that lines and then going deeper into the process of evolution, one hits the arguments of Manfred Eigen, Nobel Prize laureate long time ago, who got his Nobel Prize for chemical evolution. In Eigen's thinking, natural evolution is a learning by matter. This leads to novel chemical information and thereby subsequently to new biological properties. The chemical information is stored in this reasoning that applied to natural products in natural product structure. And the genotype level the would be available on the fragment level right here. The fragments which make up the, 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 the uh, natural products would be the chemically equivalent to genotypes, and thereby to DNA and RNA. Natural products, therefore, as they would be then in the second step, would, would be the equivalent to a phenotypes. It would be expressed in them. The genotype would be expressed in the phenotype. Mutation of the genotypes, and that could, for instance, be by recombination, several things would then lead to a pool of novel phenotypes, which in this case would be the pseudo natural products. This then would be selected to selection, as it is in evolution, would lead to new chemical matter that has new chemical information and new biological properties. I've used here the language of evolution as it is in biology and as it applies to chemistry. And I think there is a direct analogy to evolutionary processes in nature in the thinking which I'm proposing to you today. Let me show you an example. Here, we sketch a bridged bicyclic pseudo natural product class which are endomorphons. In endomorphons, you get a merger of the indoor fragment, which occurs in numerous alkaloids, with the morphine fragment, which also occurs in numerous alkaloids to these indoor morphons that do not occur in nature. We applied these compounds, made a couple hundred of them in a variety of biological assays, and we found they were active in a cell-based assay that monitors the uptake of glucose by cancer cells. Cancers have an adapted energy metabolism. They grow rapidly and in, have an increased demand for uh, metabolic energy to fuel synthesis of biopolymers. Therefore, they overexpress glucose transporters and then take up glucose in a rapid manner to use it in glycolysis. And the transporters they overexpress are the so-called GLUT1 and GLUT3 uh, proteins that are directly related to cancer. So we set up an assay, cell base, to monitor that. In this assay, we monitor the uptake of 2-deoxyglucose by means of those transporters into cells. Once in the cell, 2-deoxyglucose is converted to the 6-phosphate, but the 6-phosphate then stays and is no further metabolized because the next step cannot be performed since it is a 2-deoxy compound. And this 2-deoxyglucose 6-phosphate can now be assayed with an enzymatic assay because it will be oxidized to the glucuronic acid. And that can be coupled to an, a, fluor, a fluorescent assay, uh, which is easy to read out. We screened about 150 compounds, which we have in-house. With a decent hit rate, we found three, three interesting hit types, the chromopinones shown here. These are absolute natural products. We found the glutors and we found glue pins. And the glue pins are just the endomorphans which I've shown to you. The most potent we had at the time, term glue pin one is here. It has an IC50 value, the concentration at which a transport activity is reduced to 50% of four nanomoles. That is pretty potent for a few compounds to be made. There's a dose-dependent inhibition of cell growth, as you can see right here. And there is a glucose-dependent inhibition of cell growth. This is the higher glucose concentration, this is the lower glucose concentration. And at the end of the day, we can conclude that we have a novel pseudo natural product, glucose transport inhibitor, inhibitor chemotype. And we showed in a variety of experiments, which I will not detail today, that it's sensitive for those important GLUT13 proteins. This may directly lead to drug discovery. And an intermediate step cell lines have to be monitored. And so we expose the compound to 90 cell lines, uh, which are in part directly tumorous and the others are not. And we found that the most sensitive cell lines down here are immediately 
related to glucose and depend on both on glucose for growth. Potent IC50 values. And at the other end of the spectrum here, you have the cell lines that are not derived from tumor cells and they are less or not sensitive at all. With this result, the compound, the, the project was moved into active drug discovery, into the lead discovery center, which is a company owned by the Max Planck Society that now picks such compounds up. Uh, we have expanded it to a second indication area. And by now we have a compound which is orally bioavailable in mice. And the next step will be probably to either spin this out or to generate a biotech that will capitalize on it. So it's successful. Let me show you a second example. And here I'll go a bit more deeper into the details of how one finds the target of such, pro of such, such small, small molecules. It will be a lot of biology, and I hope the, the chemistry community will be following. The biological problem, I'm in a circle, I begin with the biology, is autophagy. Autophagy is self-eating. It is a process in which cells degrade intracellular components. Thereby they recycle nutrients, they eliminate harmful proteins, like protein aggregates. On the other hand, this, this contributes to homeostasis and survival of cells. If it is misregulated, then things can go wrong. Cancer uses it as a survival mechanism. It feeds itself, so inhibition would be required. And neurodegenerative diseases use it to get rid, and in this case, would be used to get rid of precipitated proteins, but would also, in this case, activate. The SARS-CoV-2 virus, from which we all have suffered for the last years, uses the mechanism to, to, to grow and to multiply, and therefore, one would want to activate it. We'd get rid of it. The key organ of the process is a so-called autophagosome, a circular structure right here, which includes proteins and organelles to be degraded, and which is characterized by marker proteins. You're going to see this autophagosome on the pictures, the next few pictures I'm going to show you. And the autophagosome is formed in the initial stages of the so-called autophagophore. This is a pre-structure, which has different proteins in it. The growing phagophore then acquires a protein termed LC31, which is lipidated and thereby integrated into the growing membrane. So LC32, as it's called in this case, is the main autophagy marker. Then the autophagosome is completed. And the next thing is, it has to fuse with the lysosome to the autolysosome. Here, in the fusion, before the fusion, there's a protein termed P62, which is a secondary marker. Fusion leads to formation of the autophagolysosome in which degradation takes place. And that process can be stopped by so-called fusion inhibitors. So the whole process can be halted artificially at this stage. We can monitor formation of the autophagosomes. This is how it looks experimentally. Here's the same process. At the outset, we express LC3 fused with a green fluorescent protein, so it is green and is distributed in the cytosol because it doesn't have the lipid residues yet. And then the cells are dri driven into autophagy, either by starvation, this is a medium that leads to starvation, or by treatment with rapamycin, which inhibits a key protein in this overall process. Then the autophagosomes form, and LC3 is lipidated and trapped in the autophagosomes. So punctate form, here we can see some of it. This can be monitored by microscopy, either by counting the number of punctae or by measuring the area occupied by these punctae. An inhibitor would now lead to reversal of the process and regenerated green fluorescence distributed in the cytosol. If starvation, if inhibition would be dependent on starvation and rapamycin, then it has to be downstream, downstream of the so-called mTORC1 complex that rapamycin kicks in. If it is only dependent on starvation, it must be upstream of mTOR. So they can dissect the process in two halves um, and thereby get a feeling for where we inhibit at the, just by running the experiment in two months. Having done that, we screened our library again and we ended up at another one. And then a very good inhibitor, it turned out to run. Out of in one has submicromolar activity in the cell based assay. Target identification includes proteomics in our case. It's very often. So we take the protein, we do structure activity relationship by synthesizing a library. We identify, identify sites where 
um, a, a, in this case, a linker can be appended with the link of the immobilized, um, the, 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 com the, the active compound on a bead. An inactive compound has a control also on a bead. And then we do an affinity isolation experiment, affinity chromophore. Lysa is exposed to those beads. Beads are washed. And the proteins that are retained on the lysate by the active probe, but not by the inactive probe, are being determined by means of proteomics. In this case, we were very lucky because we found exactly one protein which we could confirm as an inhibitor, as, as a target. And that protein is termed gram D1A. Very interesting. There are three grams, gram D1A to C, very similar in terms of their structure. They have a transmembrane domain. They have a so-called start domain, a star-related a lipid transfer domain. And they have a gram domain, which is known to bind to phosphoindositides. When we found this protein, there were just a few papers out. The function of the gram proteins was unknown, but there was speculation. I thought that could be lipid transfer, cholesterol transfer proteins. Ultimately, this turned out to be true, as we found. I'm going to show this to you in a minute. And when we were about to publish, two independent papers came out that confirmed what was going on. It was known that such sterols are required to form vacuolar structures upon starvation by glucose. So the hypothesis, the biological hypothesis was, is the gram D18 target protein a transfer protein for cholesterol during the biosynthesis of the phytophore? The next step would be to show that the small molecule indeed hits the protein of interest in the cell. This was done by means of a so-called nanobread experiment commercially available from Promega, very powerful. The compound of interest is equipped with a fluorophore. The protein of interest is equipped with a nanolociferase. The nanolociferase, when the substrate fed it, generates luminescence. When now the compound of interest binds in the vicinity, then there is also vicinity to the fluorophore, and then you get transfer and the biofluorescence emission at a different rate. And that is exactly what occurred. We equipped our compound with a Budipi fluorophore, and this is this black one right here. You get transfer of fluorescence, red. And if you bring in a ligand that is not equipped with the fluorophore, it competes this thing off then fluorescence drops down. That's what out of Raman did. We bring in an inactive compound, it cannot compete it up. And this is concentration dependent, or in other words, it's an experiment that proves that there is target engagement in the cell. Very high ranking experiment. Genetic equivalent, we knock down the proteins with different small interfering RNAs and count the LC3 punk pepper cell. And you can see, by knocking them down, the number of punk that goes down. This effect is not too pronounced, maybe because there are other cholesterol transfer proteins and it's time dependent. So after a short time, it's much stronger than a longer time. Maybe other proteins take over, but it's also a very clear. Biophysics can be show binding in a biophysics experiment. Again, here is the Bodipi uh, label equipped, uh, appended to the, the, uh, the, the, the original ligand. And then we perform with that fluorescence polarization experiment. The polarization is high if the compound binds to the protein and low if it does not. This can lead to KB values. So there's a dissociation constant of 49 nanomolar for binding to the star domain alone, 50 nanomolar for fusion of the star domain to the gram domain, but no binding to gram. And that is true for gram D1A, but not for gram D1B and C. We can compete off and calculate IC50, which is a good agreement with what we found in the cell based assay, leading to the conclusion that yes, gram D1A probably is the primary target. Autograms bind to the start domain. We did identify the binding site by means of hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometer. In that experiment, the protein is monitored in the mass spectrometer, individual peptides are being analyzed. And then the experiment's being repeated. In the presence of D2O. Protons exchange for D, plus, and that can be seen as a shift in mass of the peptide. The same is done in the presence of a ligand. Then, at the binding site, this exchange will be slowed down and it will become time dependent. 
And that can be monitored in the mass spectrometer as well. So with time, exchange would be slower where binding occurs. And that peak can be coded on the protein structure. And as you can see here, these are the regions for which it will slow down. This is the binding side of autogramming, in this case, an analog run two. Do the same experiment with cholesterol, gives the same binding site. So autogramming seems to bind by cholesterol. As would be clear, it would be the start domain and not the ground domain. We crystallized gram D1C, one of the isomers, used the structure to develop a, a homology model for gram D1A, and then docked the, the and then encoded the, the, the amino acids which um, which, which, for which the exchange was slowed down. You see this here for cholesterol, there is the program D1A. So this is the cholesterol binding site and it's identical to the uh, binding site for autogram in D1A, uh, for, auto, for autogram in two. So it binds to the cholesterol binding site in this process. Selectivity, I'm increasing the level. Each experiment creates more confidence in, that the, in the uh, uh, hypothesis being correct. We looked at several cholesterol transfer proteins determine again fluorescence polarization values. And it was only gram D1A start domain that showed a KD as it should be. All the others we looked at did not show binding to this particular small molecule. So indeed, this is a compound that is highly selective for the gram D1A problem. Once the compound is in hand, now we begin try to learn a bit more about bio biology itself. First question, can we identify the stage of formation of the for uh, of the of the autophagosome at which the, uh, the grand D1A protein might occur. To do so, an experiment was set up that monitors the early stages of this process. So when the phagophore begins to assemble, it gets phosphoenosyl 3 phosphate, which then brings in docking proteins, and they also introduce a they bring in a protein complex which has a protein termed ATG5, autophagy protein number five. ATG5 is a marker for early stages of autophagosome formation. So we monitored the area of the autophagosomes per cell or of ATG5 equipped with a green fluorescent protein. Starving the cells, uh, halting the process by chloroquine leads to a high level of autophagosomes and to a high level of ATG5. And we, when we bring in our compound, autophagosomes go down and, auto, and ATG, ATG, ATG5 also goes down. Or in other words, we see that the formation of early stages of autophagophore formation is inhibited. And it seems that gram D1A has to play a role in initiation of the autophago of, of the autophagosome of autophagosome initiation. It's downstream of the mTOR C complex, but it's still in early stages. We can show in cells that it's cholesterol that plays a role to be, do that. We, one can use a, a, a polyene uh, antibiotic termed philippine that binds cholesterol, uh, cholesterol asterisk, uh, so to speak. And what you see here is green, uh, as gray areas. This is um, what cholesterol bound to philippine is. If we now starve the cells, then you can see that the area indicative of cholesterol, the bond to philippine goes up. This here is new. And if we now inhibit, then it goes down again. So in other words, autogramin 1 inhibits cholesterol accumulation. We confirmed this by a separate biophysical assay and leading again to the conclusion that gram D1A might be important for cholesterol transfer during the early stages of autophagosome biogenesis. Finally, let me show you a biological experiment that now comes to a functional conclusion. I show you two colors, orange and green. In orange, we see gram D1A. This is the target protein meant to transfer cholesterol. And in green, we see LC3 as a marker of the autophagosome formation. What you will see is that the green color and the orange color will merge will take some time. And then you will see the autophagosome, the green color, diffuse away towards the nucleus, which is the expected behavior for the formation of an autophagosome. So there it is. This is the green color. 
Now it merges the orange color, takes some time, and zooms off in this direction. Boom, there it is. Movie again. Green color, merges the orange color, cholesterol transfer happens, and it zooms off. So what we see is that obviously our conclusions match. gram b one a targets the growing autophagosome, may transfer cholesterol, and then the whole conclusion that we were drawing seems to match. So this is the picture that emerged. It appears that gram d one a is located with its transmembrane in one, transmembrane domain in one cellular membrane. It reaches out with the gram domain to phosphate nosotides in the neighboring brain. And once they are in contact, then the start domain transfers cholesterol between those two neighboring membranes. That is a mechanism that is in agreement with all experiments we found and also in with uh, the conclusions that the, the biological community has drawn independently from our work. So long story short, by using this whole approach, we found a new protein involved into autophagy and we found the mechanistic rationale for how it would be. I've guided you here through a workflow which I summarize on this picture. It shows how we go ahead when we find new targets. It's a lengthy process that can last sometimes a couple of months, sometimes a couple of years, sometimes it's not successful, not an easy thing to do. We get a hypothesis for our targets from very different approaches. In this case, it was a proteomics experiment. We then confirm this by Western blood activities, um, active, active versus inactive probe. I've not shown that to you today. We have uh, selectivity assays, activity assays, we validate genetically, we synthesize probes, do biophysics, I'll show those to you. We prove the engagement of the target, in this case with nano bread. And finally, we go for functional assays, which are protein independent. This is a workflow that has proven sort of reliable and efficient for a variety of examples over time. I'll show you what we did in one of the concluding pictures uh, of this lecture. But I'd like now to go back to chemistry. Having one example or two is good, but would there be more? Is it true? Will the assumption be true that if we make compound libraries, that they'd be diverse in terms of biology, in terms of nature, uh, of, of chemistry? So how would this be if we take a relatively small set of natural product fragments, we combine them differently, we change the fusion patterns, we change regio and stereoisomeric features? Will we get novel bioactivity? Will it be different from the natural product? Will the combinations be diverse in both realms? Will the fusion patterns match? Will individual fragments play roles that could dominate always, so they would, you would not want to use them? Or could we even use that to uh, reason forward? To answer such a question, I need to introduce one more essay, which is now a one that's a complicated one, but also very powerful. It's called cell painting. In cell painting, individual compartment in the cells are stained with different dyes, green, yellow, red. Six dyes are being used. And then they are monitored in different fluorescence channels. This gives a set of signals, which can be analyzed by a software term cell profiler available on the web. And then a mouth, from that, a variety of parameters is deduced. In this case, Initially, 1,700, which we reduced to 579. Each of those parameters can be then added to the others in a fingerprint manner, a barcode. You can generate a barcode that characterizes the phenotype of the cell. Each individual parameter may not be too relevant, say size of the nucleus, distance between the membrane and the nucleus, uh, is it round shape, or is, is the ER big, or is it small, whatever it is. But as a total, they characterize the cellular compound. We would then ask, do our compounds change such parameters? And if so, then the percentage of the change parameters we would term induction. It's a major for bioactivity. We would say change, each parameter should, should change at least plus minus three as compared to the median determined for a series of control compounds with known bioactivity. The second parameter would be to compare the entire fingerprint profiles to those recorded for the set of control compounds with known bioactivity. So this would then give 
a measure for the kind of activity. Profile shape similarity is the second parameter we have. If there is a new profile for a potent compound, this could lead to a new mode of action, a new pathway, and ideally to a novel biological file. So let me see how we did that. I give you four compounds which qualify as fragments. These are natural products. They are already fragment sized, so they also fall into our definition of fragments. We've converted them into ketones, double bonds were removed. Uh, one ketone was generated here. And then we combined them with other fragments by means of carbon condensation, palladium catalyzed annulations for indole synthesis. This will give chromons, uh, in this case, chromonon fragments, um, Fischer indole or pick the Spengler reaction. We get combinations of those two fragments and the reactions which generate complexity. So we do not append the fragments in a spider-like fashion. We combine them in complexity generating reactions. It gives a pseudo natural product classes with different combinations, 13 subclasses, regio isomeric, diastereomeric, and a total of about 250 compounds were made. Here you can see the structures which we had, and uh, you can see that they differ. They are fairly different in terms of the arrangements. We have the indole um, in, in two different diastereomeric arrangements. We have here the same thing. Um, for the chromonone in there, we have uh, synomine in there, changes up to here, and we have the indole plus the chromonone, and here we have um, Gamesia fulvin protein. These are different compounds. They were characterized by chem informatics. In this case, it's the so-called Tanimoto similarity index. And looking at the Tanimoto index and looking at the similarity inside those classes reveals that in the classes, the similarity is high. But if you look at the similarity between the classes, then it's mostly low, only 20, 25%. Or in other words, we have a chemically diverse library with homogeneous subclass. And that's good. That's exactly what one would want to have. For biological diversity, we resort to the cell painting assay for similarity and potency. And then we do intra interclass comparisons by means of cross correlation analysis asking is class one similar to class one, which it is. Is it similar to class two, which it is not, 44 versus 69%. And this can be then transferred into a so-called principal component analysis, reduction of dimensionality. We follow what the, the, the chemical, what the, the uh, chemical informatics does, no new development here, and reduce it to two or three dimensions, leads to such plots. I'm sure you've seen them before. So let's see what we get for biology. First of all, all compound classes turned out to be active. They have an induction value that's higher than 5%, and that suffices for analysis. A 10 micromolar typical concentration for the analysis right here, the overwhelming majority of the compounds is active, has a median induction that's high. And half of the compounds actually have truly high induction, 20 to 40%. So this library I've shown to you does have pronounced bioactivity. Cross similarity analysis shows that in the subclass, you see that right there, similarity is high. Between the subclasses, these kind of comparisons, similarity is low. Or in other words, the phenotypic bioactivity trend parallels the chemical trend. We have a library that is diverse in terms of phenotypes expressed, but it's homogeneous within the individual subclasses. So let me give you a few examples. Now the principal component analysis. What you see here is all indole containing compounds. And you can see they fall, they nicely fall into different subclasses, different colors like that. The median biosimilarity is 45%, and therefore between them it's low. Therefore, we would term the indole a non-dominating fragment because it can occur in different classes and different bioactivity can be achieved. It does not dominate that. The same is true for chromonon as well. Here, the biosimilarity is a bit higher, but you clearly see those subclasses. There's a two out, a few outlier here, outliers here, which lead to the 74%. So chromonon, you think, is also non-dominating, but that's uh, so different combinations get different kind of bioactivity. That is different for synomenin because you, everything seems to be one cluster. Synomenin leads to a unified activity. Bioactivity is similar, and therefore synomenin would be dominating, and you would not use it 
for subsequent synthesis because it will always lead to the same bioactivity. If we take this to heart, I think we can use it to prospectively design compound classes that will show different phenotypic profile. We would take the two non-dominating fragments, namely indole and promenone, and combine them. And the prediction would be that this now should be again a new compound class with different bioactivity. And here it is. This is the class, and it differs from the other indole containing compound classes. Similarity is low. It also differs from the other chromonon containing compound classes. Selectivity, selectivity is low. So, yes, chromonones and indoles are non dominated fragments. They will be good partners for diverse pseudo natural product libraries. And one think, I think we can use that to design, if we want to, novel pseudo natural product classes. Let me give a second example. And here a bit of chemistry just for the fun of it. It's a chemical community. We thought we'd take a look at so-called tricyclic bridged indole natural products, which occur in numerous uh, uh, pseudo natural products, which occur in numerous natural products. Two synthesis methods. On the one hand, the so-called interrupted Fischer indolization, um, popularized by Nidigard, uh, a Fischer indole synthesis set in the stage. Here is the intermediate three three sigma property rearrangement attack on the intermediate form imine leads to cyclization. And if now a nucleophile is appended such that it can attack to form imenium ion, the substituent R here, then this will give a tricyclic compound. The second one is a 1,3 dipolar cycle addition to this double bond in the indoor system, which is least aromatic in this case. And that has been described by several authors and my others in this case right here. Uh, it's an, an, an and nitrogen substitute oxy L anion, which one can generate from that. And the dipole is between this and this atom that can then add to this double bond to give such de-aromatized indolene systems with that, which have quaternary center. We synthesized collections. I show you here five of the individual subcollections. They are again diverse. The cheminformatic analysis has been done. And we see that we can be made about 10 to 40 compounds. Uh, per class. They have different fragment types, they have different combinations and different connectivities. Biological analysis for these and comparing them with reference compounds gave a very interesting result because this compound here and the close analog locates in this principal component analysis together with a cluster we term the Aurora cluster because this is a cluster for inhibitors of the so-called aurora kinase. The prediction would then be that this here would be a new aurora kinase. And those of you who have worked in kinase chemistry would initially say, that does not look like a kinase inhibitor to me. And I said the same, but look at that. It was checked, it was, in, it was investigated, and this is an inhibitor of aurora kinases A, B, and C in, let's say, the low micromolar, submicromolar, it's very astounding because it's a completely unusual chemotype for this kind of activity. All right. Finally, let me show you what we did over time. This is a zoom version of the molecules for which we identify the cellular targets or the mode of action at the very least over the last, say, 15 years like that. It started melophilin A. Uh, targets dynamics, that was our first target ID. And the latest one is now Ronin published this year in Angawan Shimi. You can see there's quite a bit of it. At one point in time, I just took a look at it again and said, well, actually, how many of those are pseudo natural products? And it turns out these are pseudo natural products. The others are uh, compounds made according to the bias logic. And surprisingly, before we even had thought about pseudo natural products, we had made them. Now, this, these are pseudo natural products. So we've made them in a more or less, I think, intuitive manner uh, without realizing what we actually do. And that got me thinking that if we were doing that, maybe others had done this as well. So we thought we'd take a look at the Campbell database, which lists about 1.7 million compounds, which have an entry for a target. So with some kind of bioactivity. We searched for natural product fragments and combinations, but excluded natural products. 
And look at that. It turns out in the Campbell database, we find 340,000 pseudo natural products. 21% of what is in there, historical compounds, qualify as pseudo natural products. That is quite a number. We find five types of fragment combinations dominate, and they combine two, three, and four fragments. We find more than 100,000 unique scaffolds, and each scaffold has far less than 100 members per compound class. The majority is just a few, so it's highly diverse. It's not as if one or two or three libraries would dominate this number. It's a diverse collection. You see the major fragments in here, the two natural products come in blue. There are fragment combinations linearly, uh, fusion edge, spiral like that. These are the ones that dominate. And over time, the fact that the number of pseudo natural products has gone up consistently with a strong increase in recent years. The relative proportion has increased from 12% to 19% in the last 15 years. So people make them and they increasingly make them. I think this is kind of a validation for the concept. And also the findings guide design and synthesis. You would want to combine two, three or four fragments because they have dominated in here. And we would focus on the five preferred fragment combination types. That would guide what it is taking the right fragments and do the combination. So far, so good. But how is this today? So at that point in time, I felt reminded of the very prominent and strong role that Enamin and yet Enamin people on the call plays for the pharmaceutical industry in these days. So everybody buys it Enamin, and Enamin as therefore has an impact on how the corporate libraries look. And we thought, you know, if Enamin has these supernatural products, the big companies will have them at all. So I contacted Alexander and Ivan and proposed to them that maybe we could have a, take, have a joint project, have a look at what's going on. And very gratefully, they gave us access to the structures of the Enamin library, 3.5 million compounds, twice as many as are listed in the, um, in the Campbell library. But look at that. In about 20%, again, in this 700,000 cases, are the members of the Enamin library pseudo natural products and therefore industry buys them. We have four types of fragment combinations, which are very similar to what we have found in Campbell. Absolutely, not quite, but very similar they are. And what we see in this case, and not surprisingly so, the fragments in this case are more drug-like than they are natural, than, than in, in, the, uh, in, 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 in the Campbell database, because this is done, this is what's synthesized um, in, in, a, in, in an environment that focuses on drugs. So there's more nitrogen uh, then there's oxygen as one example. And that's all good. So again, it seems the concept is applied very intuitively. And without going into detail, I can say that a third analysis is about to be completed together with Paul Leeson, one of the uh, very experienced drug hunters in the industry, who has asked the questions, the, the question together with us, do they actually occur in marketed drugs? And they do. In the last 20 years, the fraction of pseudo natural products in marketed drugs has gone up significantly, and they have been in marketed drugs for a long time. So, yes, pseudo natural products have been, are, and I predict will be made increasingly in active drug discovery, in active chemical biology research, in academia, and in industry. It is a concept that had not been recognized. People have done it in an intuitive manner. And I hope that we will have found a general design concept which will enable a more efficient design of bioactive small molecules for both chemical biology and for drug discovery. I've come to my end, the end of the lecture. You see a recent picture where we were on a retreat. The Max Planck Society owns a castle in the Alps. In fact, it does. So we were in Bavaria. And you see here my group, my department, it's more than my group, there are many other people there, all dressed up in Bavarian dress code. So this is, these are not costumes, this is very typical. I'm here, you see the typical lederhosen right there. Yeah? And then this, this, this vest is a Bavarian thing. These are other people in there, lederhosen, longer case. Uh, you see the women wear their dirndl as it is, very nice. Yeah? 
And this is a compilation of my, my group, my secretaries and the technicians are in it. The Chinese group members, Indian group members, they look particularly funny with their Bavarian hats like that. Yeah. Very funny, we had a good time. I'd like to express my gratitude to my senior scientist, Slava Ziegler, this is Slava right here, is the senior biologist in my group. She is the one who leads the biology activity. Sonja Sievers and Axel Paul. Axel is here, Sonja is there, are the two who lead our screening set. They are the ones who do the biological analysis. More or less single-handedly, Axel has in implemented the cell painting assay in our group, very nice. Michael Dugalunas, right here is American, has a uh, project leader position in my group and he is the, he's Mr. Chemistry in this particular case. I'm grateful to them. Collaboration partners, Yawen, Andre, and Kamal were in our, in our department before they are now in the, on their own. And here's collaborating partners on the different projects that we had over time. Grateful to them. I'm grateful to the funding agencies, which you see on the bottom. And I'm very grateful to the invitation to speak to you today. And I can say it has been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Waldman. And if there are any questions, please there go. feel free to ask. Are there any? Ah, there's one in the chat. Yes, it says. Is it Schloss Ringberg? Yes, it's Schloss Ringberg. <laughs> the picture was taken at Schloss Ringberg. Absolutely. You can see the Schloss in the back. Absolutely. That's it. <laughs> High above Tegensee. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, I don't see any chemistry or biology related questions. So uh, I have one, perhaps uh, uh, it was done previously by other guys, uh, but uh, can we do uh, similar analysis for uh, marketed drugs? I mean that uh, do the same fragment identification and then uh, look for some combinations on their off, so find some pseudo drugs. Yeah, I think we can, um, it's, a, it's a good one. There is actually, there is a paper out there that was published by a group from UCB. Uh, it's a J. Metcam paper about five years ago, something like that. And it's called Rings and Drugs. So mm -hmm. these people have taken marketed drugs, have disassembled them into fragments, similar to we, as we did with natural products, and have asked which are the typical fragments that occur in drugs. And they came up with a list of fragments and their prediction is when you combine them new, you should find no drugs. And I think they were perfectly right with the analysis. It just would have to be done. So I believe that if one would do this with the fragments and drugs, you could get very close to drugs from new time. I believe that is a very good proposal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, are there any questions at all? Okay. Then uh, perhaps uh, any uh, perhaps more questions will arise when people yeah. look that uh, in in a recording because uh, not all not everyone could uh, attend, unfortunately, because of the situation. Uh, so I would like to thank you, Herman, very much for the election again, and I hope that someday we could, you, you could come to at Inamin site at, at Kiev when it's this, well, all, all this craziness is over and give us a lecture in Lviv. That would be a very good opportunity for us, I believe. And of course, I believe that uh, some uh, interesting results will arise from our joint yeah. projects. I'm absolutely think. sure about that. So yes, yeah. indeed, let's hope that the times will improve and that we, we can travel again and meet in person. Absolutely. I'm yeah. all good. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. It was very nice to, to see you and to have you today at our lecture. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Then bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And bye to everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.